I see Miss Marks, but I don't see Mr. Miller. I don't see Mr. Miller either. He was at rehearsal on Friday. I, I just got a message that says Mr. Miller needs to turn on his camera. Well, oh, I see. Okay, there. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Miller. Oh, that's good right. Morning, yeah. or good afternoon. My apologies for that. Oh, it's no problem. I have that very same tie, and I wouldn't have known that if you hadn't turned on the camera. So. Yes, in fact, um, they warned us that we had to turn off people who didn't have their camera on, so that would happen. Well, you know, we... Uh, the marshal's office put us through a lot of practice sessions before we started doing this thing. So and you still sounded like Darth Vader this morning. <laughs> well, I, I've got an equipment issue. Well, so. that was fixed. And then you you Good afternoon, Your Honors. Deborah Marks on behalf of GGH 11. And may it please the court, we are here this morning on a, uh, a golf course that, you've, that the second DCA has seen before. Um, but the issues are different this time. Uh, the, this is a relatively narrow issue appeal. I mean, we are here because there are covenants that are in a declaration of a homeowners association. And those covenants um, include a provision relative to the property that is in question here that say that, a, that somewhere along it, a, gal a driving range must be constructed and maintained. Um, there was prior litigation. People tried to build residential property. That's how it came to you before. They wanted to build residences. It was determined that the use restriction on that property, that it could not be residential, that it is restricted to golf and other, athle other athletic activities was in fact valid. And of course, those people then stopped paying their taxes. And when they stopped paying their taxes, the property went for tax deed. This is not common areas. There is nothing that puts this within the ownership of an association. It is a separate 18 acre parcel that was acquired um, by a tax deed. Um, the record reflects that the tax deed was taken in the name of Tarpon uh, I'm sorry, clarinet. And then um, there was a transfer via quit claim into GGH 11. And GGH 11 filed an action that sought to that have to the golf course. There was, there, there was a lot of discussion in the briefing about the fact that the tax deed, there was an intermediary you didn't take exactly from, as a result of the tax deed, the, your predecessor took as a result of the tax deed. Is that, can you talk about that? Absolutely. It's actually a yes and no on that because there's an affidavit in the file prior to summary judgment that said that that was by the owner of GGH 11 that said they were beneficial joint venture partners with the entity that took title at, during the tax deed and that the transfer to GGH 11 was an unwind. So they actually were an owner, but we believe that to be irrelevant because we provided to the court cases that talk about the fact that this is a, a um, a new chain of title and with the new chain of title whatever interests or obligations the tax deed holder has or what would then go to its successor owners so, so what, what what restriction is on the property as your client holds it do they have to do they have to run a, a, a driving range in your estimation do they that's why we're have here. to hire somebody to run a driving range do they what what is what is other athletic use mean where you what it what is your position our position is because of 197573 because any of those things would require the owner of this property to expend money for things that are not essentially code compliance i mean they call it sanitary and other um, conditions undesirable conditions uh, they're not required to construct or maintain it that they how, do you, um, how do you uh, deal with section 720.312 uh, as it relates to this, which is the specific really statute good. on this topic for um, homeowners associates? And that, that is and it's because of the fact that there does have some apparent conflict that I asked for oral argument, because that is really 
the rub of what this comes down to. And part of the confusion comes from Gaynor versus Fiddlesticks, which is uh, one of the cases that is cited by Appley. In Gaynor versus Fiddlesticks, there was an issue of membership in a club. And what happened in that case is that case was in fact decided before what was then 617.312 came into existence. And in 617.312, it had the language that's now 712.312. And the association used that as a defense. And they said, because of this new statute, they all of the covenants survive and you have to do this even though it makes you expend money. And if you look at what Gaynor versus Fiddlesticks actually said, and not what, act, what is here, is what it said was, that statute didn't exist at the time, and we can't consider it. It didn't say our result would have been different. And, and, well, and, we, don't need, we don't need Gaynor versus Fiddlesticks if we can read the statute and say, this is the specific statute that controls property and homeowners associations. Except for the fact the that statute. this court has already addressed that in Cricket. And I'm in sorry. Cricket Properties, this court found that the more specific statute was in fact the 197 statute. And in fact, to clarify things, the 197 statute has been amended since to say that it's only the liens and it's only the assessments in Futuro that are protected. And that's where I think you get into, if you look at, at Sugar Mill versus Wires, you look at Cricket, you look at the language within those, they tell you that what the intent of the legislative intent of that language was not to expansively keep everything there, but to protect the ability of an association to lean later on assessments that came up afterward. All I can do is read the language of the statute. You know, that's, a, that's a big thing nowadays, the text, textualism. Agreed. And if you read the language of the statute, while it I says- Judge Black laughing at me. It more specifically states within 197, where first, because your 197 is your contract in buying a tax deed. And your contract in buying a tax deed, which again gives you a new chain of title, starts at 197552 which says only those things that are within this chapter survive against a tax deed, period, end of story. So then you go to 197.573 for what survives. And when it talks about what survives, you do in fact have covenants that survive, but not if they require you to expend funds. So, so, so your argument is that 197.573 is the more specific statute because it only refers to tax deeds Whereas an argument could be made that 723.12 is a more specific statute because it only applies to property that has have declarations of covenants in a homeowner's association. Correct. And when you and then as I said, you go further and you can see the legislative intent, intent followed that by after these conflict things that started looking like conflicts came out, they've amended 197.573. And in subsection two, they've broken it out to take that language that is in both what's now 720, that used to be 617, and the similar language that's in the condominium statute, and say that it is it refers to those providing for liens for assessments that accrue after a tax deed. It's not an all expansive everything. So you don't have a situation, and there's good public policy for this, because you want people to be to have taxes paid. But people, On the other hand, there seems to me to be a good public policy for people who belong to these associations to not to have to worry every night when they go to bed that one of their neighbors hasn't paid their taxes and, uh, and, and endanger all the covenants that, that would apply. But those covenants that deal with assessments that take care of common expenses are covered. This is not an ex a, something that deals with common expenses. Oh uh, yeah, but we're talking about use of property. And again, we're not saying that it can be used for residential. No one's saying that. Well, no, what you're what saying is you is, don't wanna to have to use it in accordance with the requirement of the covenant. No, sir. What they, we're saying is we can't be compelled to build something and maintain it. That we can be precluded potentially, but we well, can't be- Well, you know, the interesting thing is, is that that's not what this order says. All this order says is you are bound by the, by the covenant. 
but what that's all it said. It didn't interpret them beyond that, right? It didn't say you, you, are, you know, it didn't issue, issue an injunction saying a mandatory injunction saying you are required to build this or operate this. But what, said, you're bound. Said, what this what the statute what the order said was that the owner is bound and by being bound they are bound to construct and maintain that would require the expenditure of money so, so you that just added and by being bound, bound by that they are required, right okay and that that's the only argue, re reason we're here is because they took away the affirmative defense and said we're not bound to construct and maintain because of the fact that we would have to expend money to do it and that does not survive the use restriction that says we can't build something else on it absolutely does but construct and maintain is a step too far and construct and maintain is not consistent with the legislative scheme or as i said if you go and you look at both cricket and sugar mill versus wires they both talk about the intent of that 617 statute that's now 720 was to protect assessments and liens for assessments which makes good sense because those assessments are taking care of common expenses of ownership of something you have a part of. It's taking care of your common areas. That's what they're for, which is why I opened with, this is not a common area. The golf course should have a driving range. There's no question they should. If they want to rent the property, buy the property, they can do that. But they can't, we cannot be required to construct and maintain because but, but the, the property does action. have to be used it has to be used for golf or other athletic does it, has anybody tried to interpret what other athletic endeavor means or other athletic activity whatever that language is it has not been interpreted although the argument in this case would it ha was that it had to be full driving range that's not in the order so i don't think that we could really argue that that came out of it although i put in there that it should not be part of it it, and it was implicit because of the motion that was filed that was granted. She didn't put that language in there, that it has to be all driving range. But in fact, if one goes back into the history of this property, you find there was being used for other things. And our complaints said they were growing sod on it. They were doing some other things. Um, so let's talk about, you talked about cricket. Now, cricket wasn't a, didn't involve a use. Interpretation, interpretation of the statute involved uh, enforcement of lien after the cricket involved. A, that's correct. Cricket did not involve a use. Right. Yeah. The other case that gets used and I believe misused is the tap. Excuse me, is the Tamiami case, and the Tamiami case is a dock case which does not talk about money. The Tamiami case, which is it is a case where there was a restriction on the deed. And, a, and granted express use over property for the, to a community for ingress and egress for a dock. And that ingress and egress, you know, they came in and they said, well, we're not marketable and we're supposed to get marketable title on a tax deed in this court, not this court. Yeah, actually it was this court. This court said no. This court said the deed specifically said it's a dock. You can't use it as something else. And again, we're not trying, we're not here today. Our motion for summary judgment on our main claim is not here today. We were here on the intervener's mo motion that wanted to say we have to construct and maintain a, um, a driving range across this property. And our defense to their interpleader was, no, we don't. Because it was a tax deed that is not the type of restriction that could require us to spend money. That's it. That's the whole reason we're here. We're not, we may be back someday on, on an interpretation of what other athletic activities are when we get the declaration that comes from the main claim. But on today's hearing, what we're looking for is something that does not broadly affirm the ability of, or the requirement that a tax deed recipient construct and maintain something on property because that is outside the scope of this scheme. Now, so if I now, correct me if I'm wrong and maybe I did not have the right idea of the procedural posture of this case, but so your client um, pleads an affirmative defense and said, we're not bound. The intervener comes in and says, you, you need to do a uh, driving range. Correct. 
you you do an affirmative defense that says we're not bound by those covenants right generally because of this tax no we said we're not bound to construct and, ma and, and maintain okay so then the intervener files a motion for summary judgment on your affirmative defense correct and that's why we're here the judge just says you're, you're bound. bound by the covenants right exactly and Did the judge really answer the question then it does because she said we're not excused from constructing and maintaining it no it says you're bound by the covenant it doesn't say anything about what you're excused from or not excused from but if, you're not excused from the covenant if the covenant says you have to construct and maintain and it says okay. you're bound by it you're bound by it it determines liability that's why we're here you know, that's what made it an appropriate order at this point is because they found we're liable to construct and maintain. And you, you are at the 15 minute mark. You didn't you didn't mention whether you wanted to reserve rebuttal, I, but you have five left. Do it I will reserve it. Thank you. OK, cool. Mr. Miller. Good afternoon, your honors. May it please the court. My name is Sam Miller. I'm from the Ackerman firm. I'm here today on behalf of Appley Cheval Property Owners Association. Judge Northcutt, to go to your question, the actual scope of this appeal is actually quite limited. The only item on appeal is the trial court's order granting partial summary judgment. And all that partial summary judgment addressed is whether GGH 11 is bound by the master declaration and the Fifth Amendment. Specifically, and, and the court's summary judgment order is in the record at pages 584 and 585. Uh, I'm looking at it. But it states that the motion for partial summary judgment is granted as follows. And it goes on to say the court declares that GGH 11 LLC and the driving range property are bound by the master declaration and the Fifth Amendment. And then in parentheses, it just provides it as those terms are defined in the motion for partial summary judgment. GGH 11 appear, oh, and by the way, there, there is a third paragraph to that uh, order, but it deals just solely with reserving jurisdiction uh, for, the, for the court for attorney's fees. What GGH 11 appears to be arguing in its papers in here today is actually the next step of the process. Now that it's been found that it's bound by the master declaration and fifth amendment, the next step is going to be, what does that mean? And as, as one of the judges mentioned earlier, there is no injunction here. There has not been any order stating in GGH, you must do A, B, C, and D. It merely states GGH 11, you are bound. And well, what then, I- then then let me ask you this, is there a jurisdiction of this appeal? Because it has a, it's a partial summary judgment that has only decided one issue in, a, in what you're saying will be a series of issues. It hasn't eliminated anybody from the case, correct? It has not eliminated anyone from the case. The motion, it, it, but the motion is for partial summary judgment, which as is- As to an affirmative defense. And as to a counterclaim. So we had a counterclaim for a declaratory, I'm sorry, Cheval had a counterclaim for a declaratory judgment. That, and that declaratory judgment that it wasn't bound. It, 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 what it sought was that GGH 11 is bound by the master declaration and fifth amendment and required to construct and maintain the driving range. That is what the, the declaration found. The court, however, entered a summary judgment as to only part of the counterclaim and those affirmative defenses. And that is why the summary judgment states the, part, the motion for partial summary judgment is granted as follows. And the right. court gives the precise language of what is granted. Now, what GGH 11 appears to be seeking here is actually an advisory opinion of the next steps. Now, to the extent that there is issue with the trial court's actual order, there are actually several reasons to affirm it. One, uh, the Florida statutes explicitly provide that declaration of covenants like the driving range use restriction, and that's what it is. It's a use restriction. The Florida statutes state that those survive tax sales. Even if, however, 
the Florida statutes gave some sort of restriction on that and allowed GGH 11 to not be required to be bound by that use restriction. Those provisions obviating grantees of tax deeds do not apply to GGH 11. GGH 11 was not a grantee of a tax deed. And then finally, GGH 11 has admitted in multiple filings, and frankly, it's appellate. Well, let me come, let me come back to that part. As I read the statute, it says, you know, the statute that uh, the GGH is relying on. It says that those um, covenants that so, and so forth do not survive or only survive in the sense, and if that's the case, if they don't survive, it doesn't make any difference. You know, they don't, they don't survive as to the grantee, they don't survive as to the grantees. Grantee, you know, they just don't survive anymore, correct? I mean, that's the language it uses. Your Honor, I believe you're making reference to 197.552. I am. The language that's left out by GGH 11 there is the phrase that comes right before that language except as provided in this chapter. And then if your honor goes to 197.5731, your honor, that language explicitly provides for the- so which, which one again, 573? Correct, one. And what 197.573, which by the way is in the same chapter, right. what that provides for is when there is when a deed or other instrument in the chain of title contains restrictions and covenants running with the land, the restrictions and covenants shall survive and be enforceable after the issuance of a tax deed or master's deed. It then goes on to other deeds to the same extent that it would be enforceable against a voluntary grantee of the owner of the title immediately before delivery of the tax deed. And so 197.5731 saves the restrictive covenants. But I would go a step further, Your Honor, and point to 720.312. And this is the statute that is more specific because it does not only deal with restriction, restrictive covenants and tax deeds, but 720. 0.312 is more specific because it deals with those within the very specific context of homeowners associations. Now, GGH 11 points to the cricket properties. They also cite A to Z. And there's a couple other cases out there that talk about within the lien context, how 197 can be more specific than portions of 720. So a couple points to that, however. We're not dealing with liens here. There is no dispute that a pre-tax sale lien for pre-tax sale assessments do not survive a tax sale. What we, what's specific here though, is that 720.312 is specifically dealing with restrictive covenants, it's called declaration of covenants, like the ones we have here. And I believe what's particularly informative, your honors, is the language from the sugar mill case discussing that very provision. And what uh, Judge Sharp in that case stated was, and I quote, the intent of this statute, talking about 720.312, was obviously to safeguard residential homeowners associations, declarations of covenants and restrictions and provisions for assessments from being extinguished by the issuance of a tax deed they were clearly in jeopardy pursuant to 197.573. That's the situation we are in here today. What GGH 11 is trying to do is trying to say, we are not bound by this use restriction. We are not bound by the restrictive covenants because of the issuance of this tax deed. Yeah. And Judge Northcott, I believe you were the one that, that raised the issue. Um, what about all the residents of Cheval? Should they lay awake at night, concerned that all the other residents, some of them may not be paying their taxes, and as a result, their house gets sold at tax sale, and then someone comes in and builds a 20-story tower in the location of one of these homes? 
Public policy definitely militates against that result, but that's exactly the outcome that GGH 11 is asking for here today. If in fact GGH 11 is trying to argue that it's not bound by the master declaration of fifth amendment. I, I would respectfully suggest that it's a little unclear, frankly, what GGH 11 is arguing because in its opposition to the motion for summary judgment, it conceded, in fact, it used the word concede, that they cannot build residential townhomes, which necessarily means they're bound by the master declaration and fifth amendment to some extent in their supplemental filing with respect to the motion for summary judgment. They make this same concession. And then even in their filing to, uh, for this, the initial brief here and the argument today, GGH 11 appears to say, yes, we're bound by the master declaration and fifth amendment, but only to a certain extent. Of course, that certain extent is never defined. And secondly, that certain extent was never actually before the court. Um, to get to the question I, that I believe was asked um, earlier, in, in terms of, you know, in, in terms of what exactly we have here today, so we have the trial court's order, which is an order on partial summary judgment. Now, the next step, of course, will be, you know, what gets sought at that point. And that's a question I believe that's going to be out there for another day. Um, I do wanna talk about the Tamiani case and the Gaynor case, because I believe both of those are particularly instructive. First on the Tamiami case. So what you have there is you have a use restriction with respect to a dock and a landing area. And by the way, Tamiami is at 185 Southern 2nd 493. You then have a sale of that lot through tax deed. You later on have a conveyance, much like you have here to another entity or to another person. Um, that individual then tries to sell the property and there's a claim that they should not be bound by the restrictive use covenant. The second DCA said, no, in fact, you are bound. And by the way, that determination was made under the predecessor of 197.573, which is before the court today. Additionally, the Gaynor case, again, a second DCA case. So in this situation, you have a community that has a restrictive covenant providing that every resident must buy a golf membership. Gaynor buys the property through a tax sale um, and then claims under 197.573, look, I don't have to pay money as required by the restrictive covenants. The community points to 617.312, which has since be, been renumbered to 720.312. And what the court explicitly says is that the problem the community has there is that the tax deed was issued prior to the enactment of the HOA statute now 720.312. It is clear from the court's opinion in that case that had it been, had the court been able to consider 720.312, the outcome would have been different. And the outcome would have been, yes, Mr. Mr. Uh, Gaynor, you are bound by the de declaration of covenants of the property that you bought. And that's the situation we have here today. So we have GGH 11, and yes, they have purchased land through, I actually rephrase that. So you have Clarinet One, and, and I do wanna go back to why this is important. So you have Clarinet One LLC, who has purchased land, this driving range property at a tax sale. You then have conveyance through a tax, through a quit claim deed, to GGH 11. And I want to emphasize this point that GGH 11 took ownership of the driving range property through a quit claim deed. GGH 11 is a grantee of a quit claim deed. GGH 11 is not a grantee of a tax deed. And I'll explain why that's important in just one moment. And by the way, those are at uh, the, the quick claim deed itself is actually in the record at page 13. And so GGH 11 takes this property 
by way of, ta of quick claim deed and now wants to say that because there was a tax sale to owners prior, GGH 11 should not be bound by the declaration of covenants, by the use restrictions in those, in those covenants. Nevertheless, the sugar milk case and that quote that I talked about earlier and the plain language, the plain, very specific language of 720.312 makes it very clear that the very purpose of that statute is to make sure that declaration of covenants like the master declaration and the fifth amendment are honored even after a tax sale has occurred when you're dealing with a homeowners association. And again, the reason 720.312 should govern here today is unlike 197.552, which just deals with solely just tax deeds and, and their impact, or 197.573, which gets a little more specific about tax sales restrictive covenants. 720.312 is specifically dealing with both of those and within the, within the context of homeowners association, which makes it out of all the statutes that we've discussed here today, the most specific on point statute applicable. And there's a plethora of case law that in terms of statutory interpretation, courts are bound by when they have possibly conflicting statutes, if they cannot be read together, they're bound by the most specific statute that is available. And that's the one that we have here today. Um, and so, Your Honors, that's the presentation that we have. Uh, are there any other specific questions that you have? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Ms. Marks? Yes. First of all, when you look at the order, the order is not quite as neutral as it has just been given to you. It says, as the driving range, master declaration, and Fifth Amendment are defined in the judge in the motion. And when you go back into the record and you look at the motion, the entire battle in that motion was not, are you bound generally? It was, are you bound to construct and maintain? And that is, and finding that we are bound as defined by the motion subsumes the fact that they raised and argued that these affirmative defenses that deal with their having been an intervening tax deed do not insulate from construct and maintain. So yes, we don't have an order that says you need to spend it today, but you have a finding of obligation to do it. And that is why we felt that we could not not appeal this at this point, because if not, we would have potentially since it, this would have been found to have been final as to that and needs to have that resolution at this point. Mr. Um, Miller read to you part of 197.573. And then he said, oh my God, people have to worry that there's gonna be a 20 story building that's put there if there's a tax deed. Well, you need to go back and look at 197.573 because he read you paragraph one. But start with the title. The title is Survival of Restrictions. So we're talking about what survives, not what's applicable just to the one party. And then go to paragraph two. And paragraph two very specifically narrows this. It says this section, this what survives, applies to the usual restrictions and covenants limiting the use of property, the type, character, and location of buildings, the um, covenants against nuisances, what the former owners deemed to be undesirable conditions in and about the properties and other similar restrictions, except for, and then it has exceptions. And it's in those exceptions that you find those that require someone who takes by a tax deed to expend money to do it. And that's exactly the core of this. You need to look at that statute in totality and see that what that statute said and as I say, now it's even clearer because they've tried to clarify this a little bit by adding a, a splitting two into A and B. But what it says very clearly is that it, you've got only those things that would not require this. That made this more specific as this court found in Cricket, 
as the um, court 50 CA found in A to Z properties. And what's unique about the concession by Mr. Miller that, well, everybody knows liens don't survive, the association liens don't survive, um, that's not even an issue here, is that the arguments that went into making that happen were arguments made by the associations that 617.312 and then 720.312 meant that covenants had said that you were jointly and severally liable with your prior owners for any assessments that existed prior to your taking title applied to tax lien holders, even though it made them expend money. That was the core of the argument in those cases. I mean, that's what A to Z was all about. And they said, no, it doesn't work that way, even though that's in the 617 language, the more specific as to tax deed holders is 197. And the contract that the state makes when they sell you a tax deed is based on 197. And 197 says, there are things you're gonna get stuck with, but it's not gonna be something that's gonna make you pay money for um, this type of expense. And it is important that it be resolved now because the language of the order said as defined in the motion and as defined in the motion, it made findings that there was liability to construct and maintain. And to that extent, what we are asking for is we're not saying it doesn't apply. No one says it doesn't apply in full. No one's ever said that. The statute very clearly says there are things about it that do. But those things that would require GGH 11 to expend money did not should not, and we should not have to litigate that any further. So to that extent, we would ask for a reversal. And thank you. Okay. Thank you both very much. That includes our docket today. And we are adjourned.